Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxi. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. So on the show today, Madeline Black. So Madeline Black, sort of a Pilates person, but a bit more evolved than that might suggest, sort of titleless movement person, interesting human being in, in terms of embodiment. So uh, we, I met Madeline in California not long ago, tried to give a COVID, failed. She seems to be okay now. Uh, joining us from there, I think now, right, Madeline? Where in the world today? I'm in Sonoma, California. Yeah. Sonoma, California. Welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing well considering the lockdown. I, I live in the country, so it's easy to avoid people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Some of my introvert friends have been avoiding people for years. So, you know, <laughs> they've had praise. Uh, let, let's, you know what, let's not talk COVID straight out of the bat. Let's talk about you and your work and your life history. So how did you get interested in the body, Madeline? Give us, give us the basics. Well, I think I was born that way. I was always moving. Uh, Always interested in sports or anything movement, climbing trees. I was kind of one of those young people. So I ended up in the track of the dance world. So through the dance training, I got exposed to a lot of different trainees. Now, this is the 70s I'm talking about. So in the 70s, it was very underground, uh, this type of work. Uh, I was taught by teachers who had studied with so many interesting, now very well-known embodiment teachers. So it's that expanse. And then I ended up in the Pilates world because as a dancer, you want to always improve your strength and prevent injuries. So, and that's something a lot of dancers were doing in the 80s. So that's how I kind of ended up there. But I had already been exposed to so many other options for movement. So you're a dancer and you're studying some Pilates. You're thinking, you know what, this will help me with injury. So that was the beginning of the journey of somatic practices. Yeah, most, I wasn't injured, but I wanted to get stronger. I was also in the gym, uh, you know, at the YMCA, lifting weights and running and doing anything I could to improve my stamina and my strength to be the better dancer. Uh, but you also don't want to be injured. And how did that open up into other things that you studied? Well, prior to that, actually, the modern dance teachers that I was exposed to, uh, at this time, it was actually when I was living in Minneapolis. Uh-huh. And um, my teachers were working with people like Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen and um, a lot of contact improvisation. Um, and we also did a lot of work on balls, interesting enough. And uh, the ball work was by a woman named Elaine Summers. Um, And the dancers were doing it to, you know, we didn't really know about fascia or muscle release or any of those manual techniques. It it was really about getting into your feelings and releasing the body so that you can actually tap into that as a performing artist Uh uh, and also to make your body move better. Uh, in terms of that. So I find my background is a very interesting uh, mixture of these alternative underground ways of working with your body before today. I mean, I didn't know anybody who did yoga back then, though I did some yoga. So it was an interesting period, the 70s into the early 80s, in terms of what people in my field, the dance field, were doing in terms of exploring movement. Hmm. Okay. And, and tell us about your Pilates journey. I think you're actually the first Pilates teacher I've had on. And if I'm honest, that's because you're the first one I've come across that I found interesting. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Cause I'm not, um, I'm not the Pilates teacher who, you know, sticks with one school, uh, one teacher, um, And that works for, um, you know, these other teachers. But for me, I'm always questioning, you know, how can I do this differently? Or how is this feeling for me? And working with people, I I work primarily one-on-one with people. And I have to sort out how, what's working for them. 
Uh, and so not always the Pilates techniques don't always work for everyone. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's where I, you know, branched out into exploring more. I got into a lot of manual therapy as well. So integrative manual therapy. So I'm a cranial sacral therapist in addition to, uh, it's a form called IMT. It's integrative manual therapy. Uh, so you can imagine all those therapies kind of mixed together so that I have this, the, the tools to address what the person's presenting to me and what it is they want to do. Do they want to have a heavy workout, like feel good and do challenging movements or do they actually need to kind of tap into themselves and do a little more breathing and a little more unwinding before they can move? So I love this integration of all of that together. My bottom line though, is to get people to move better and feel good. It's kind of whatever works, isn't it? If people can move better, exactly. people can feel good, then you know who cares where it comes from in some ways. And maybe let's dig into Pilates a little bit then, as you're sort of the first Pilates person in 250 episodes, I think, we've had on. Um, so there was this guy who judged Pilates, he came up with this system. Some people think of it as sort of, you know, yoga without the spiritual stuff or whatever. I mean, like, what is Pilates? Like, I've only done a couple of classes in it ever. So why don't we start with the absolute basics and then sort of build up to your uh, innovations approach, things like that. Yeah, you know, that's always the big question because people's experience when they go into a Pilates class can be so varied today um, because of how it evolved. Um, Back in the 70s, um, it was really a very tiny industry, mostly in New York. There was Pilates in L.A., but, um, you know, it was the history. You can read about the history, um, and there's different opinions about the history. You know, he's no longer with us. He died in the 60s, so... There are a lot of narratives around who he is, what he did, not mm-hmm. all of it factual. Um, and it's hard to get factual information, actually, because um, there's not a lot of it out there. Uh, but he was, a, um, he was a boxer and had asthma. There's a whole long story there. Uh, he was interned in camp that they know for sure at the Isle of Man. Uh, and then he just continued to develop his own which was more like calisthenics, really. Oh. The old Swedish, um, if you look back to the history of exercise, and you go way back to the 1900s, uh, even 1890s, you know, you're looking at the Swedish gymnastics and the development of that type of thing. So he kind of took that and then went on to develop his method. Uh, and the method is, there is a sequence, but it's not a set sequence because he evolved the work as he was working with various people. But in the 20s, he moved to New York City uh, and then set up his studio there. And that's when he connected with the ballet world and um, pretty much people lived in the neighborhood. If anybody had a problem, it was always, let's, you should go see Joe. He'll help you. So that became the rumor, you know, that, and it's not a rumor, he actually did it, but, you know, people would say, you know, you need to see Joe, you need to see Joe. You know, I grew up in New York, and one of the things as a kid in the neighborhood is you would, when you were going to someone's house, or if you were going to address someone, like if someone saw me on the street, Mm -hmm. they wouldn't say, hey, Madeline, how are you? They'd say, hey, Black, what are you doing? You know, so everybody called each other by their last name. So uh, this okay. is, just, just to be clear to listeners, it's Madeline Black. That's not a sort of racial term. But she's- yeah. So uh, this is my narrative about how the word Pilates became uh-huh. because he called his system contrology. Uh-huh. So in New York, they'd be like, you, you, you know, you hurt yourself or you have a problem. You need to go see Pilates, Pilates, Pilates. So then it just became... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the word. There were a lot of people didn't realize that was his last name. Um, what makes... And, go on, go up you. you. Mm-hmm. Yes, go ahead. Uh, is this something that makes Pilates unique? Because I've seen, you know, stretching, strengthening exercises. There's machines that are sometimes used that look like sort of S&M torture equipment. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, it seems fine. I, you know, I know people that swear by it. I don't have any problem with it. Is, is this something that makes it what's its niche or what makes it its thing rather than something else? What makes it Pilates and not something else? That's a very good question. I, I see it as it's a whole body system and the apparatus is what I 
really you should be calling it as apparatus, not equipment, because equipment in gyms, you know, you're, you're actually holding something and pulling it or something. I mean, we are holding straps and pulling, but it's, it's an apparatus where the movement is coming from your center and from your trunk. And so as you're moving, you're, you know, the straps are either assisting you or giving you the resistance. And the difference is it's very contained in terms of its feeling and its range of motion. I mean, certainly in Pilates, there's some very extreme, you could see people doing bridges, you know, full wheel on equipment, but they've developed a strength uh, and integrity to get to that place. Uh, so if you're a really hypermobile person and can naturally do the wheel and yoga and things like that, if you try to do it on a piece of Pilates apparatus, you can't rely on your mobility to achieve that movement because you have to contain yourself. You have to engage your whole body in order to do that movement. It's quite powerful. Um, so that, that's what people don't understand because you can see and say, well, that just looks like a yoga bridge on a reformer. You yeah. know, what's the difference? But no, actually, if you tried it on the reformer and you've never done it on a reformer, you don't have the integrity and the strength to do a wheel and move you won't be able to do it on the reformer. It'll be impossible. So that's, um, it's a system that has, you know, the human body can only move so many ways. We're designed a certain way. Right. It's the same right? with martial arts. You see the same punches. And yes, you see the same posture. So, you can do. It's, just, it's just how the body is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've had heard some Pilates teacher call Pilates like a martial art. Um, because you're also you need to be focused, uh, and you and they're in the system. You know, there's where you place your hand and your foot, and how you move in and out of positions. It's, it can be very precise if it's taught that way. It's not always taught that way. So you mm. could also look at Pilates as like a martial art in, in that way. Uh, so that's what I find so fascinating about it. And then the apparatus just gives you an just unlimited possibilities of doing all sorts of movement, which is why today you see so many variations and people who have been creative and doing great work with his apparatus, but he passed away in the 60s. So these are not movements that he actually did, but we don't need to be attached to what he did because I believe if he was alive today, he would be embracing all this new material that um, Pilates teachers today are inventing with his apparatus. And Pilates sort of sometimes has a bit of a bad rep, doesn't it? In certain mm-hmm. circles. And I've also, I've come across a few Pilates teachers. They seem to be quite different in what they're doing. Like, I guess there's styles of yoga. So, you know, different approaches, different ways of doing different schools, you know, some seems to be very control oriented. Like I had a body control Pilates and this right. almost sort of fascist sense of controlling oneself, which right. you will find in martial arts and some schools of yoga. But, you know, what do you think's led to some of some of the bad press and what do you, what are some of the schools out there to give people some maybe distinction so they can make some better informed choices? Yeah, well, there's the family tree you have to consider. So, right. you know, there, there was Joseph and his wife, Clara, uh, and then they had a niece working. And then there were these dancers who were the next generation of teachers, uh, all in about the same period, some a little bit older than the others, um, who then became teachers for him. Like he worked, they worked at his studio under his guidance. So they were the original teachers taught by Joe. And then they went off and opened their places in New York and started doing their work. So that's where the family tree starts. You start to see, oh, that style, like for myself, I can watch a Pilates teacher move in a class and I can tell how they move and which school Right. person that they right. trained with by yeah. how they move. Yeah. So that that's where the family tree, the branches start to really spread. So I could mention their names, but they, they started to, and then it's the bodies that they worked with, like Carola Trier. She worked with a lot of dancers. Uh-huh. Uh, so her approach uh, was in that way. Um, Kathy Grant's another person who worked only at NYU with dancers. However, this woman was brilliant in terms of being able to see in the body what wasn't working 
and how to get it to change so that the dancers could move in the way that you know the choreographer was was doing but she also became very well known for doing more rehabilitation work without any training she was she, her training is movement her eye for watching movement and figuring out what was going on in that hip and the spine that wasn't that was causing this person problems so she gave us those skills uh, and Eve Gentry was another person who went off to Santa Fe and she was working with opera singers and other movement people who live in the country, horse farms and things. So she developed a way to work because you can't, unless you're, I mean, you can, but it's really hard to just jump into full on Pilates. It's like walking into an Ashtanga yoga class, you know, second series. And I've yeah, never done yoga yeah, before. Cool. You can't do that. You'll kill yourself. Right. Yeah, that's, that's a, I mean, you can't. Yeah. You know, you just would walk out of the class. So this is so as people were getting attracted to Pilates, this is what the Pilates teachers were dealt with. These people were, and I was the same way. I moved to California and there was very little to no Pilates here. Certainly no one knew what it was in 1990. And I started training people who knew nothing, and even about movement, like this is your pelvis. And do you know that it can move in this way? And you breathe. How do you breathe? Are we breathing here? Can, you know, how do you lift your leg up? I mean, it became so yeah. basic. Maybe um, I would jump in. I think this is a really good question for listeners, whether they be yoga teachers or martial artists, which is mm-hmm. how much experience is required to be your student. And people will knee jerk might say none everyone can join but i think that's always a good answer because i for example i like teaching embodiment to people who have at least meditated for a couple of years who have at least done a few yoga classes and right. i don't want to teach them their ass from their elbow and that's my personal preference as a teacher and some you know i've known aikido teachers who are great with beginners and aikido teachers who are fantastic but shouldn't be let near beginners you know and i, I think there is definitely it's a really smart question whatever your art to say where, you know, what prior skills and knowledge do you need for, for me to start working with you? Or else you're just going to injure people and confuse people, right? Exactly. You know, and there are some teachers who are really brilliant at taking that non-mover and teaching them to feel their body and be aware. Uh, you know, oh, my scapula is supposed to move? <laughs> like, or my shoulder blade, they would say, you know, I didn't realize they moved. This is, you know, you start at that basic level with people. And there's some incredible teachers who are really good at that. And these particular teachers may not be the ones teaching you how to do, you know, the wheel on a reformer. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know, and, and that's what their niche is. And they're actually really good at that. And then the person can advance into someone else who, you know, is more doing the full on Pilates. Um and so, you know, especially on Facebook or Instagram, you're seeing, you see all these teachers posting um, videos of themselves doing these incredible moves, but that can really frighten a lot of general public and your clients. So I can't do Pilates. I'll never be able to do that, you know, which is a shame because there is a way to enter into doing this movement system, just like if I choose to enter yoga. Um, but also cross training is incredible, which is what I love to do. You, you know, that's interesting what people portray and not realizing how off putting and scary that could be. Mm-hmm. You know, handstands are really popular, but that's a, that's a full on thing for a lot of people, you know? Right. Uh, or the super flexible yoga. So people get the idea you have to pretzel. And, you know, I've got one new yoga teacher and credit to him. He's incredibly flexible, but he almost never shows it unless he happens to have a very, you know, student who's been doing stuff a long time, was a dancer or something. Occasionally he'll do something crazy. I'm like, whoa. But, you know, generally he doesn't even show it because he doesn't want people to think that they can't do yoga if they, do, if they can't do that. And he also doesn't want people to feel that that's more advanced right you know there's sometimes you hear this language it's more advanced to do this it's like no you're just more flexible like my wife's hardly done any yoga but she's just naturally incredibly flexible and doesn't have the muscle mass that i have right Right. it's it's just just how our bodies are made you know so you wouldn't say she was more advanced in me in yoga just because she's born a certain way um right yeah different age whatever yeah i mean i think about i had um my um stepdaughter here and she had a friend visiting you know in their teens and uh, you know, she's, oh, you do yoga? And, and this young woman says, I've always wanted to do it. I've never done it before. And then she drops, standing up, she drops into a back bend and stands back up. Yeah. I was just like, okay, I've been trying to do that for how many years now? 
<laughs> and she just did it right in front of me saying, I've never done yoga before. So after that, that's when I, I you yeah, know. Yeah, I'll give up that. It's annoying. Same my wife is super annoying. She'll just put her feet to 180 degrees, put her body flat on the floor. I'll be like, oh, you know. So, yeah. uh, it works. so it's like that can't be yoga. That can't be what it is to be a vase. Yeah. So I always say not in this lifetime for me. <laughs> my next lifetime, maybe. Right. And, and also, why would I want to, like, you know, my hamstrings are long enough. I can put my shoes on. How much longer do they need to be? Now, as I get older, there's a certain amount of flexibility I want to keep. But I'm, yes. I'm not particularly interested in being able to chew my own toenails. Do you know what I mean? Like, there's, there's only so much flexibility exactly. I need. Um, mm. What was the second point you made there? Because I, I, I caught on that one. But then after that, you made another good point. Do you remember? Uh well, no, not really. <laughs> not really okay. No worries. So what about this control thing then? Because it does seem like there's this very like well, slightly fascist tendency in some Pilates. It, it can be severe. It really can be severe. Yeah. And it, it really stems from, in my opinion, so uh, it, back in, see, this is where I have a perspective because I was in the Pilates world before anybody knew what it was. And then I, I can see the whole how the whole method and the history of it and how it all evolved, of course, from my eyes, right? Someone else's eyes would be different. Um, but you have to understand it came from the ballet world and the ballet world, especially in the early years, not so much anymore, thankfully, um, you know, it was very strict. You'd have this, uh, you know, in ballet class, you'd have this master teacher, she old lady sitting in a chair with a stick and she'd be pounding on the floor you know, the beat, and then she'd take the stick and hit you, you know, if your turnout wasn't good enough and, yeah, you know, yeah. and you, and she would just yell at you yeah, and, yeah, yeah. you know, and you had to just be like, Ugh, you know, because if you didn't, you know, I don't know what would happen. You'd think you would be killed or something. That's how I felt in those ballet classes early on. It was like, don't breathe because she'll come over and hit you. And, you know, so it, you know, there was a lot of that in the ballet world. So the teachers that, you know, followed this type of, I don't know, right. This because of their experience, right. It's like the human body, right. The human being, we have an experience of trauma. <laughs> so what do you do if you don't process it is you turn it on to your kids or another person. And so I feel like there's been this trauma introduced into the world and, and it's just been kind of rippled through and carried on. And the way to contain it is I have to be in control. And if I'm not in control, I'm afraid of what's going to happen here. Well, so, this is a story of Western civilization, according to Charles Eisenstein and some sort yeah. of ecologist. You know, there's a, this is just a more extreme version of uh, yeah, the sort that, of Western way of dealing with, de dealing with fear, you know? Yeah, exactly. And, and that's how the training was. Um, and I'm only talking about, you know, a few, not all teachers were like that. Like I mentioned, Kathy Grant being extremely intuitive. She was strict because, you know, you need discipline, but she was also incredibly intuitive, as was Eve Gentry. Uh, she wanted you to be, you know, walking in a certain way or talking or coming into her studio in a proper form, like martial arts. When you yeah. walk into yeah. a dojo, right, you have a certain protocol that you follow. You know, it's respectful and it's disciplined. So there was the discipline, but then there's the angst that goes on top of that discipline as, as a person who cannot, has to be in total control. Otherwise, yeah. I'm going to fall apart. Um, and the other factor that happened in the Pilates industry in the early 90s, around 92, there was a lawsuit. So there was a, a jockeying for the rights to the name Pilates. Yeah. Uh, and that traumatized, I think, the whole community. And it went on in the U.S. This only happened in the U.S., uh, but it did affect the entire world. Because it wasn't that big at the time, you know, meaning there weren't many studios uh, in London. Alan Herman, uh, he studied in the 70s in New York and came to London and started. So you, in England, you had your you have your own history in terms of the early years of Pilates. And then Australia had some. But basically, the rest of the world, even the rest of the United States didn't have that much. Uh, and the lawsuit just dragged on for about eight years uh, until it was finally uh, deemed that it was a generic term and that somebody couldn't own the name. But in that period of time, that's when people were positioning themselves, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm the one who owns it and only I'm the one who can train people, you know, so it was that control and 
grab for the power. Uh, the empire building, the control, the, yeah, yeah, we're really seeing this at the moment, you know, in, in, in the yoga world, this has been a big thing. And some people are getting so tired of it. There's been the sort of battles around what could be called yin yoga or what could be called mm-hmm. yang yoga. And there's all the, and different schools have set on different solutions, some very tight, you know, in, you know, Bikram or whatever, some very loose, right. like um, contact improv, anyone can say they're doing that, you know, right. um, there's different spectrums. There's the open, open source stuff like the um uh there's forms of dance that have instead of copywriting have used um creative commons licensing we've had people on from open floor for example and it's different solutions and i you know i've come across this myself there's things i've open sourced there's things i've had ripped off you know mm-hmm. like someone just ripped off the embodiment conference really badly and, right. and it's like well they've sort of taken the model and they've taken the speakers but we didn't you know we can't claim copyrights this they've sort of got a point you know they're not totally bad guys but similarly have they been disrespectful probably Right. You know, it's really tricky. Quick break from the interview to tell you about our shop and a deal we've got on there and also about some events that are coming up. So if you go to embodied facilitator slash shop and use the code, use the code podcast, podcast 50, podcast 50, podcast 50 is the code. You can get 50% off, 50% off anything in the shop. And what have we got on there? How to design training, trauma for facilitators, breath work, leadership, resilience, uh, life purpose. There's a bunch of books. There's a bunch of e-courses, mostly for facilitators, trainers, coaches, yogis, different e-books, but that code will give you 50% out of anything at all there in the shop so that could save you let's see up to 100 pounds which is about 120 dollars so well worth having that code go to embodiedfacilitator.com slash shop also on that website you will see embodiedfacilitator.com slash events dash calendar just look under events under the main title you'll see all the stuff we've got coming up for events we regularly have free online events if you're interested in embodiment we have them on coaching life purpose marketing or trauma all sorts of things so have a look at the events page you can see the different one day events we've got coming up related to the conference and all kinds of other stuff okay so all of that is on embodiedfacilitator.com and remember that code there that code is podcast 50 if you want 50 percent off anything there you go a good deal back to the interview where's that line between being naive and a fool and being sort of contracted and controlling it's hard to know where because from the inside everybody thinks they're right you know the naive person doesn't realize they're naive and the control freak doesn't realize they're a fascist it's just from their point of view that's the sensible position to take yeah yeah and then you know it's business too people want to you know, it's all about the money. Their the product. And someone's getting a percentage. It's all about the money. And I tell you, once the money goes up, things change. You know, we see, I've seen yeah. a very different uh, tone around the embodiment conference. Now people, now it's got a lot bigger, for example, you know, there's something mm-hmm. changes and people go, Oh, maybe I want a piece of that money or prestige. You know, when those two things are involved, it, it, right. it changes people. People act different. We've having to having to put contracts in place in quite firm ways that we never, never needed to before it's really mm-hmm. disturbing to me in some ways you mm-hmm. know and it's very difficult to get out of that game because if you can just be a sucker if you're if you're trying not to play the game at all so it's um it's a tricky one yeah. we talked about it on a number of podcasts actually we talked about um uh there was one called owning the dance which is a, a podcast people should listen to Okay, well, give us something from Pilates then that might be just practical and useful for people. Like, what's a Pilates principle? I mean, I'm not expecting you to lead an exercise now, obviously, but <laughs> what's an idea from Pilates that might be useful for listeners? Yeah, you know, again, it depends on which school you come from. But um, generally, it really starts with the spine and the pelvis. So the ability to um, feel how you engage. People call it the core. <clears throat> it drives me crazy. Um, because the core is not just your abdominals, it's, it's your whole trunk and it includes your hands and your feet. So, you know, you have to be aware of how your, what your feet are doing, because when your when your feet are engaged, even if you're standing on the floor or your feet are in the air, it affects how the synergy moves through your legs into your pelvis, you know, into the trunk. So all of that is very important, but it gives you a sense of your, your trunk being 
the initiator of movement. Uh, and so breathing, I mean, I could break it down into body parts, but it's really how those body parts work together in a synergistic way. Um, I personally, the way that I like to work with uh, Pilates is I, I look at gait patterning. Gait uh, patterning, so what that yeah, is? Yeah, walking, watching. Oh, gait, walk. like, okay, not like G A T, G A I T. Yeah, gait so patterning. Say a little bit about that. I find that, I find that interesting. Oh, it's, I'm really obsessed with it. <laughs> oh, go for it. Go geek out. Go for it. <laughs> no, it's, it's a good form because that is your basic human uh, locomotion. Right. right. That's how we you know, move. Right. We don't jump and hop so much. We, we walk. Yeah. Yeah. We walk. And even if you have, uh, let's say a problem with your legs or you have no legs, uh, the mechanics of walking is still possible. Right. And the mechanics of walking really comes from, uh, your pelvis motion. So, the, so the, the pelvis and spine, uh, is what drives walking. So it's that figure eight movement. So the, if you're walking on your feet, of course, you're, you're rolling through your feet, hopefully, as you're walking from your heel to your big toe, you kind of roll through the foot. And during that one step and rolling through the foot, it sets up a whole dynamic of how your leg moves, your pelvis moves, your spine's rotating, how your arms are swinging to amplify that movement. And when along that chain, we have something that's not quite moving well, uh, due to a lot of different reasons, I could give you it could be a, a joint reason. It could be a fascial reason. It can be an organ stuck. It can be you're not breathing. It could be, I mean, there's so many, if you want to isolate it, it's kind of all of the above, but you can, uh, you can actually observe that and say, look at that. As they're walking, they're swinging that pelvis around instead of actually articulating through the knee and the hip to swing and bring that leg forward to do the heel strike. Uh, so what's that causing? Well, that's starting to call, cause problems in the hip joint itself. It starts to get um, more, no movement in it, which means it could, I just don't want to say it's arthritic or it could get injured or it's just not moving. And after a long period of time of one of our joints, especially your hip joints, if they're not moving, they're going to change. They're going to change. They're going to get harder. The fascia is going to get more rigid. Uh, and then the joint's not going to be happy. And then your whole spine has to adapt around that hip problem with every step, step you take. So that can manifest in terms of lower back pain, your mm -hmm. neck pain, uh, all of that. So you can actually see um, quite a bit of function in somebody when you're watching them walk. And then from there, what I do is I kind of zero in and say, okay, it's a combination of how that foot is functioning with the relationship of that hip. And if I can address that through movement, then all of a sudden you're going to be walking better. And all of a sudden you're going to be like, you know what? I don't feel that tension in my back anymore, or my back's not hurting anymore, you know, or my ankle's not giving me a problem anymore. So th this is kind of like the investigation I love to do. Um, so gait is my thing in terms of how I look at it. And then I use all sorts of movement, Pilates movements, because that's my go-to with the apparatus and um, a lot of mat work, kind of yoga-like. If somebody, if you looked at it, you might say, well, that looks like yoga, but Pilates has mat work. Um, what kind of stuff do you help people with? Do you have a specialist in Madeleine? Is it like, you know, fitness stuff or is it like health conditions? Like what's your, th who says, you know, they said, you know, go to Joe, you know, who says, go? what people do we send? Yeah, right. go to Madeline. Yeah. You know, I have a variety. I have, uh, like, for instance, a, a client here in town, super physical man. You know, he's uh, in his, he might be mid to late 40s, loves to rock climb, loves to play basketball, uh, very serious um, CrossFit routine that he does that's incredible. Uh, the things that I would never do. But he'll call me up. I don't see him regularly, but, you know, I'll, he'll call me up and say, okay, I'm having a problem with, you know, my squat or my piston. What's that called? A pencil squat? Well, the one-legged where you squat down and stand up? Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, and, and I'm, you know, he's struggling and wants to do that. So, you know, I would go over and observe him move. I actually look at his gait pattern and I, you know, I would notice that, oh, his, he doesn't have good dorsiflexion in that leg that he's trying to squat on. So there, and then his hip was swinging out to the side. His spine was adapting by kind of moving over to one side. So there was all this adaptation that he was doing in terms of trying to do a very simple squat and come back up on one leg. So we had to do a lot of work around his feet and his hip. 
and he's progressing and he's, he's aware now that he stands on one leg more than the other. So even when he starts a squat, he wasn't even aware that all his weight was on his right leg. So the whole time he was training this pattern in his body that was inhibiting him from doing this pencil squat. Now, these kinds of movements to me, that it's not my um, goal to do that because I don't find that very functional. How's that going to help? Like you were saying, I want to be able to cut my own toenails, you know. If anything, those kind of squats could actually wear your hips out, you know, when you're, I think people in their 20s and 30s especially don't think about what are you going to be like when you're in your 60s and 70s. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not on most people's daily radar. I, I just, as I've hit 40, part of me is really um, taking aging seriously. Yeah. You know, there's a way in which I've gone, okay, so I, I might be 80, you know, hopefully, who knows? <laughs> and, uh, you know, a few things are a bit worn out. You know, my knees are knackered from Aikido. And, you know, this is this other, you know, my, these teeth aren't coming back that have eroded out of my skull. You know, there's, there's, yeah. there's a few things I'm going, okay, so. It's not like when you're young, it's kind of more just like, oh, well, that broke, but now it's fixed. Yeah. Uh, well, you might just, oh, that broke and it ain't going to come back. Okay. So maybe I don't want to break another one. There's, there's, right. a, there's a way in which, and I, I don't think aging has to be this, you know, depressing. Kind of, I know lots of very vibrant elderly people who live great lives and like, Aikido you know, teachers who throw you around. Um, but there's a way in which aging is a reality and taking that seriously is, is definitely something I've noticed and going, okay, I, I, I want to be just comfortable, you know, in my own body as much as anything when I'm 60 or 70 and not groaning every time I get out of a chair, like a lot of people I know. Oh, I know. And what people don't realize is that your body is your, is your history, (laughs) you know, from being in, being born, you know, in the womb even. And when you come out, you know, you've already developed a certain pattern and then you have this pattern And of course, if you go through the development of movement as a kid and you start to grow up and you have certain patterns that you just kind of keep making them more and more and more deep, deep in your brain and in your tissues. And then you start deciding either to play some sports or do some activities or not or no activities. And that's the history of your body. And then as you get older, you're having to move and negotiate your day based on these patterns that you've developed over a whole lifetime. So if you could get a person young enough, you know, and to help them shift their patterns and how they move, uh, you know, it would benefit them as they get older. They, people don't think children have a problem. Oh, they fell from us. They were swinging in a swing really high. That's just frightening to me. And you see a kid go flying and they land on their back. And of course they cry, you know, and yada, yada. And then they go running to mom. And then after a while they're okay. And then they, you know. Oh, they're fine. Right. I mean, there are, they are more soft tissue than we are, (laughs) you know, Uh, they're more cartilage. You know, we have, we get a little bit more rigid and more bone like as we get older, but, but there's still some effect to the tissue in their body that's going to impact their pattern. And I think kids should get special attention when it comes to therapy. I think they should get manual therapy and they should work with movement teachers. I really do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where do you think the whole Pilates movement's going then? Like, what's your sense of the direction it's moving in now? Like, yoga's obviously changed a lot, and you know we've seen all kinds of developments in the yoga world. Like, which direction is the Pilates world moving in? I know we weren't going to talk about COVID, but I don't know. We can bring it in now. I think. (laughs) Listen, we've given people half an hour break from fucking. Okay. So you know what? Let's bring it up to speed, Madeline. Why not? The last twenty minutes. Let's uh, let's uh, COVID. Uh, The world has has shifted now. So actually, before COVID, I could say the Pilates world, you know, was has turned into corporations. You know, there are big companies uh, that are running training programs, selling equipment. Um, doing conferences uh, all over the world. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, I travel, all, I mean, I'm traveling now, but that's been my business. I travel the world, present at these conferences, you know, in Seoul, in Shanghai, in Singapore, you know, in Europe, I'm in London a lot, you know, going all over the place, you know, going into either small studios, you know, training them, which I love the most, having that contact small group, uh, or big conferences. I, I did a conference in Brazil last year. I taught in front of 600 people. That was just mind blowing to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Those audiences. It's yeah. Crazy. So, 
that's where it was going. And it was the well, international well, yoga Pilates rock stars who travel the world, yes. live on a plane, live out of a bag, have an Instagram yeah. account, which expresses a very small percentage of their actual life, you know, and exactly. it's a little bit mad and unsustainable, wasn't it? It is. Yeah, it is. Was, I would now, say. I mean, yeah, I know. Well, that's a, for my career. Which online is, now. Yeah, it's a small percentage of people who are who are doing, you know, what yeah. I was doing. But the studio, you know, but the growth of the industry, you know, they, they're hungry for education. They they want to improve their skills. Everybody was opening studios. and um, But now, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know what's going to come out of this. Uh, it's hard for the, and I'm sure yoga studios are in the same position. All yoga uh, studios are dead. There's going to be very few studios after this because all the teachers this is what I'm work online. Going to happen with the Pilates. Now, what started to happen in the U.S. a couple of years ago, maybe just two, um, was a franchise. Somebody started a franchise, so there's this uh, franchise company uh, that's not truly Pilates because they combine TRX and Basu. Do I say that right? The little half ball thing on the floor. Oh, no, I don't know what it is. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I've seen it, I think. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's yeah, like a half ball that's the on the floor trend, yeah. and you stand on it and you, you can do balancing things and you can, you know, it's like an unstable surface that you try to do core work on and things like that. And so, you know, they combine, you know, putting like TRX and this other piece of equipment and, the ref- and they only use the reformer and I think the wonder chairs in there. And they have this like intense workout with the teacher with the mic with a routine, kind of like Bikram, you know, where they have to say the whole routine, you know, because it's a franchise. To have a franchise, you have to have a product that is repeatable and is sure. unique to you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Pilates, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is why Pilates lost the lawsuit back in 90, uh-huh. Uh-huh. 98, because nothing was repeatable. It was always changing. Okay, it was it wasn't like the beat cram sequence where there was yes, there was, was no yeah. sequence. The um, one side trying to get it uh, um, to keep the trademark was saying it was a sequence, but then the person's clients were coming in and the judge asked them, you know, what is it that they do in the session, and then they were like, well. It changes every time I go in there and it changes every time because they were in a different place in their body and this is what they needed. You don't need to, you, you know, you know, training effect, you can't keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. Your body totally adapts to it and then you don't get stronger and you're not challenging the nervous system. So doing the same routine over and over and over again is not great training technique, but that's the only way you can franchise. And that's why um, Bikram was successful. This is not in the United States so much anymore. Um, but, um, it, but now there is a franchise that has been growing because there are people who are like, you know, I like this Pilates thing and they know nothing. They've just done some sessions and they're just like, I think this is a good business. I think I'll buy a franchise and then I'll just have people come in and they'll do this weekend training and, you know, we'll get this up and running. So it's, he's still doing what, trainings in Mexico as well. Bikram apparently. And yeah, I know they can't, and he it, can't. If anyone out there is listening who is attending those trainings and giving him your money, what the fuck are you doing? This is just a, what the fuck are you doing? It's just a small rant, Madeline. Excuse me. It's not aimed at you. There are still people getting on a plane and training with this guy. Stop it. Okay. Ran over. Sorry, Madeline. Uh, See, you can say things like that. I I feel like I can't say things like that. But everyone feels like they can't. Everybody's scared of people's imaginary lawyers and it's bullshit. We need to stop <laughs> living in fear of bad people's lawyers. Right. So maybe the franchise will survive the COVID. You know, I don't know. Um, so right now everybody's just scrambling. Uh, and yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, so that part's sad to me. Um, because yeah. there are vibrant people who can have their own business and do a great work for their community uh-huh. in a small way. And, you know, it's not big money. I had a studio for 30 years. I sold it two and a half years ago. Uh, but for 30 years, I ran a studio. It was just a mom and pop shop, just mom shop, actually. It was just me. You know, and we all, I was able to provide an environment for, let's say, six to eight teachers who made a decent living. We didn't make great money, um, but at least we paid the rent and had a lifestyle that we loved. And it wasn't about, you know, building your retirement or your portfolio. None of us had that. You know, so this is what, 
we love to do, and I'm, I'm afraid that uh, perhaps it's not going to be possible anymore. I don't know. Hey, I, I guess also different arts have different overheads or different abilities to go online. So yoga is fairly straightforward because people just need a mat. But then right. there's some forms of yoga that require, like Iyengar even, you know, might require a lot of blocks and cushions and things. And you know, most people don't have those at home, and people definitely don't have a Pilates reformer. Oh, by the way, listeners, what do you just say briefly what a reformer is, just so people know what that is? Yeah, it's a uh, low-lying bed, if you want to look at it as mm-hmm. a low-lying mm-hmm. bed, with a carriage on it that you can stand on, kneel on, lie down on, and it moves, you know, um, and the springs are attached to the bottom, to the bar and there's a foot bar. So you can like lie down on it, put your foot on a foot bar and do Mm -hmm. some, you know, straighten and bending your knees. There's also straps behind you that can go onto your feet or you stand and hold these straps. And uh, so, I mean, it's amazing amount of movement you can do on this one piece of equipment. If you have a home piece of equipment, it's usually the reformer and they make home more home style. Um, okay, so it's, it is affordable, accessible. I mean, it's not as cheap yeah. as a yoga mat, though, right? So, no, uh, it's not. No. Uh, so, it just, just strikes me that all arts aren't equal in their ability to be done at home. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, I think it's one reason yoga is so popular is it doesn't require a lot of space or equipment. And that's certainly going to be increased by this, isn't it? That yes. some people okay. don't have the space to dance. You know, like dance is difficult to do at home. Even if you can go on Zoom and do it, I don't have a lot of space. You know, I, I live in a flat. If I start jumping around, my neighbours are going to be knocking on the door pretty quick. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, my, yeah. underneath me, I don't really want to be jumping up and down. I'd be the one with the, with the room like, banging on the floor. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm British. I, I get embarrassed by that. So it's, you know, it's, it's that, but I mean, jokes aside, that means I'm much less likely to do dance at home than I am yoga. Right. And, I, and I, I'm just sort of wondering out loud about other things and how well they translate to this new virtual environment though i'm also i'm also almost seeing like online mum and pop store studios where a teacher will go online and at first their students where they're sort of 15 students from the block you know that they work with generally right. but now you'll see like the odd australian or canadian dropping in who was like their ex-student or their student's boyfriend that lives abroad now or something you know right. and it's really interesting you're getting these little online they remind me of the local yoga studio because they're still people have quite a loyal following. They don't do a different class every day. You know, most people sort of stick to a class, um, but they're online. So I find that really a fascinating move that we are still seeing these little communities, but they're just not quite so geographical. Yeah. And, you know, the drawback for me on that is, you know, I miss the uh, the hands on work. Yeah, that's true. It's so effective. I mean, if you think of yoga, you could be, you know, in a downward dog. And even though you're cueing them to, you know, press through their hands, lift the sit bones up, you know, bend your knees because your spine is, you know, too flexed or, you know, um, you still to get someone to come and pull on you. you just It just feels so good. And then it makes bigger changes, you know, in your body. So that you can't do online, unfortunately, um, yeah. <laughs> unless you do a partner yeah. thing. I did a, a Zoom session uh, and it was a father and a daughter actually. And I got them to do a little hands-on with each other. I could talk them through how to do it for each other. And that was, that was quite fun, but that was only two people, not 50, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there are definitely been yoga classes that didn't do hands-on work and didn't need that. Um, there's a case against hands-on work in that it's an external thing that you can't replicate on your own. So, you know, I, I, but, but as personally, I do like touch and um, it, it's, it's a weird world where we're not touching each other so much. And I'm, I'm still, I think now, and just for listeners, just to place the date here, because it's my it's 14th of April. We've been on lockdown for about a month now, right, Madeline? Is that right? I'm, it's Groundhog Day a little bit, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's now starting to really hit people, the touch thing. I'm really, you can go a week or two without it. I'm really noticing people now suffering quite badly, particularly who are on their own now. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I have single friends. It's really tough. I mean, I'm, I, my husband's here, so we have each other. Yeah, I'm lucky. I get a good cuddle oh, every night and every morning, but it's, um, you know. Another thing I'm interested in actually is somatically, we're only touching one person now, Madeline, right? You have your husband, I have my wife. 
it touches quite a big somatic influence on our state, our embodiment. And in the past, I was hugging different friends, touching students, whatever, you know, yeah. uh, playing, you know, kids, whatever, picking them up. Now it's just one human being. I wonder if if that will be a sort of a stronger influence on, on us somehow. Do you see what I'm saying? That it's, it's well, that one touch is a very specific embodiment that's influencing us. I know that's super interesting what you're saying. I hadn't really thought about that. Um, plus energetically, you know, it's the same and it's energy that you have communed with, you know, you did ceremony, you got married and yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a deep level of touch. There, There's a Much different than your friend. Um, but that's also good for our nervous system to have, you know, when you touch, well, I don't have any animals. I don't know if you have any animals at home, but you know, if you have an animal, that's a totally different touch when you're yeah, holding yeah, like the people's dogs in the park sometimes, that's, you know, <laughs> that's just cats like me. It's cool too. So it's in touch monogamy. I might do a Facebook post on this, the, the, the strange impact of touch monogamy, uh, what, what, what that. Mark, yeah, I don't I think want it because de- there's no way it isn't an influence. Maybe I'll start getting more like my wife and speaking in the Ukrainian accent. Who knows? Who knows? Listeners, <laughs> listeners, if you are hearing me speak like this in the future, then you will know what has happened. Um, okay, that's more like a bad Russian accent, actually. So, uh, Madeline, God, <laughs> no, where, where's your husband from? Uh, he, uh, he always says this five generation LA. LA, five generations. I bet he has shiny teeth. That's how I like people from LA. Um, okay, sorry, man. I'm not going to insult your husband. So um, let's wrap this up. We need to wrap this up. So a couple of things to finish. Uh, where can people find you on the interweb, Madeline? Where is a good place to go? Uh, well, on Facebook is Madeline Black Pilates. Mm-hmm. Um, same with Instagram. Well, actually, Instagram is at Madeline Black. I got that one early on. At um, Madeline Black on Instagram. I'm going to check that I'm following you. I like to keep in touch with people I've interviewed. Mad E. Spell Madeline for us. Oh, M-E- Madeline, yeah. It's spelled a lot of different ways. Um, M A D E L I N E. Madeline Black. Line. <laughs> um, yeah. Madeline Black. And I have a website, you know, www.madelineblack.com. And I have been doing free one hour Zoom sessions. Uh, that I recorded and I'll be posting those on my blog post and sharing them soon for those who didn't get to see it. Um, and this is you with the white hair author of centered organizing the body through kinesiology, movement theory, and Pilates techniques. So you've got a book out as well. Yeah. Correct. It's actually, I'm working on the second edition that I'm hoping will be, well, they're saying ebook by the fall, possibly, you know, the publishing industry has also come to a halt. There's no printing going on. In right. <laughs> yeah, so, you have good uh, teeth. Look at that. All Americans. It's not just people from LA. Nice website. And you got in there early, madelineblack.com. I'm sure there was, you. how did you get in so early? What was the, I'm just, just curious. Uh, you know, I had friend, you know, I got on the internet That's really friendly. early, um, in the before it was i had a client a long time ago was working on it in berkeley and i didn't even know what the hell she was talking about you know it was like what and she set me up so <laughs> right um, you're like thanking you know <laughs> you're, you're like no i don't want any shares in apple or google go away um, <laughs> yeah right <laughs> <laughs> why would i want bitcoin that sounds awful okay so madeline do you have a closing message about the body today <sighs> You didn't warn me about that one. I know. I just thrown it. <laughs> Give us a good quote from your book or something that people quote back at well, you. Whenever. I just think any movement is good movement. That is, uh, Madeline, that is a good one. Any movement is good movement. Yeah. That's just move. In its simplicity. Yeah. Just move. Yeah. Okay. Well, Madeline, this has been fun. I'm going to call this one non-fascist Pilates. Um, <laughs> um, you've given me oh, a sort of... Am I going to get in trouble? <laughs> No, I'm going to get in trouble, Madeline. If you okay. put me and anyone else in the room, I, I'll be like, I'm the trouble magnet. You're actually safer around me. So okay. that's how it works. And you trust me, Madeline, this has been great. I appreciate your time once more. I will see you next time. I'm in California. If yeah. we're allowed out of the country before 2025. So <laughs> thank you for your time today, Madeline. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Have a great day. 
some ways to uh, get more, to give back and to get more involved now. So um, the biggest request I have would be to share the podcast with your friends, people that you think would really enjoy it, um, email it to them, put it on your social media, tell them about it, old school. Um, yeah, really appreciate that. Equally, if you want to support us financially, you can go to Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash embodiment podcast and give us a dollar an episode. And I'd say they're well worth a dollar. So um, that's less than a pound if you're in UK-ish. So yeah, please go there. Um, on the embodiedfacilitator.com website is where this is hosted. If you're most people, I think, listen to for iTunes. Um, iTunes, we'd certainly appreciate a review. The way iTunes works means that a review means more people will find it. iTunes regards it as more important for searches. So even a couple of sentences review really does help as a little thank you to us. And if you want to go to embodiedfacilitator.com, you can see the actual you know links to the sites. There's comments on there. Um, the Facebook group tends to be where people discuss things. So if you go to uh, put in the embodiment podcast into Facebook, there's a page which is relatively quiet and a group which does have some discussion on. So um, yeah, I will reply to things personally there. So um, also on embodiedfacilitator.com website. Uh, there's all sorts of freebies there. There's videos, there's free ebooks, there's ebooks you can buy. And of course, there's our newsletter list. If you want to stay in touch and learn about things like the Embodied Facilitator course and our, um, you know, our next Embodied Yoga Principles teacher training, then go to that website and you'll see a little pop up and you can um, get the newsletter through there. Okay, so I think they're the main ones. Tell your friends, pay us some money on Patreon, give us a review on iTunes. Uh, send us your email if you want to be on the newsletter list and get involved on the Facebook there. Oof, bit long. Uh, pick whatever you like that works for you. Mm-hmm.